Greetings, everyone. This is Jeff Wilkerson, professor of physics at Luther College, bringing you the next in our series of what to look for in the night sky. We're talking about the week of February 3 this time around, uh, working our way through 2025. So we got a big week. We've always had big weeks anymore. Uh, it's going to be a moon week by the end of the week. The moon starts out one third full and is nearly full. It's over 90 percent full by the end of the week. Uh, washing out almost everything you want to see at the start of the week on the evening of the third you go outside and the the, the one-third full moon and venus are both in pisces on opposite ends of pisces so you've got venus on the western edge of pisces and you've got the moon over toward the eastern edge of pisces the venus is going to be moving it's going to be tracking we'll talk about it on the night so you can watch the motion of venus against the background stars this week uh, but the moon is sitting about three degrees. Remember, your finger at arm's length is about one degree, so a couple of finger widths. Uh, the moon is below the galaxy M74. It's a beautiful galaxy, but it's a tough galaxy to see. It's a, a face-on spiral. We have these spiral galaxies, and, and, and they're big flat things like my hand here. And you can see them edge on. And when you see them edge on, you're looking through a lot of stars, a lot of integrated light. You see a lot of light from it, a bright slash of light face on they're big objects on the sky but their surface brightness is low that is to say they're not that much brighter than the background sky and they're really hard to pull out sometimes because you're looking through the thin part like the thin part of my hand right here and so you don't see as much light in your line of sight in the path that's coming to your eye and and that's the case with m74 it's a it's a t i found it to be a tough object uh, to see sometimes when I'm when I try to see it and I see it face on with a moon sitting just three degrees away from it My guess is it's impossible, but you can go ahead and give it a try But you can learn the area and come back next week after the moon has gone past fall And, and check it out and see uh, if you can can pull this object out of there uh, Two nights later on the fifth uh, the moon all of this is in the evening just after it gets dark so we're talking about uh, six o'clock, seven o'clock, maybe eight o'clock in the evening. We can look at uh, the moon on the evening of the fifth is now sixty percent full, and it's moved across the sky, and it's conveniently located at sixty percent full. It's not so bright that it's washing out star-like things or planets, and Uranus is just sitting about five to six degrees uh, to the south and the west of the moon on this evening. They've got seven o'clock, and you'll see about the moon. And you get your binoculars. This is perfectly placed so that the binoc you have binoculars. Most binoculars that you have will show Uranus as an object down below the moon over here. So get the moon over on the left edge of the field of view and look at the lower right edge of the field of view. And, and it's 5.7 magnitude. Remember, the magnitude system counts backward. That's right at the very edge of naked eye visibility under good dark skies. Uh, and it gets brighter as you, as you step forward, two and a half times brighter for every step in magnitude. Remember that, because we're going to talk about it over here. And so you, you, the stars get brighter that way. So this is a, it looks like a star, sort of a, a faint star right there, but it should be brighter than the other objects around it. And you should be able to tell it has that bluish green glow like we talked about with Neptune and, and so a week or two ago. And so you should be able to tell it has a kind of disc-like bluish green glow to it. So you can see that it's a planet there. Uh, one night later on the 6th, the moon's now two-thirds full, and it sits about half a fist at arm's length above Jupiter. So it's in Taurus now, and Jupiter's great and big and bright right there, and, and there you go. On the 8th, let's go back and look at, at Venus in the evening sky on the 8th, and it's in Pisces. It has moved toward Omega Piscium, a fourth magnitude star in Pisces. So you got good dark skies. You can see that. Uh, binoculars will help you. And v Venus sits about three degrees below that star. So, so check that out. Uh, this is a star. We talk about the circlet of Pisces, uh, this grouping that's a little, uh, I guess a circlet. Uh, well, why would we call it that if it weren't? Uh, it's a little grouping of stars. This is the first star that's on the tail of Pisces, the big swing of the V of Pisces that comes out below that circlet. So start to learn some of the stars of Pisces that way. On the 9th, the moon will have moved near Mars. Remember Mars, we've been watching Castor and Pollux, these two bright stars. Uh, Mars has been moving relative to Pollux and, 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 and moving toward Castor a little bit into the middle part of, of Gemini. And the moon is sitting right there now. You've got Castor, bright dot Castor, bright dot Pollux, very bright dot Mars. And right between Pollux and Mars is a, is a moon that's now approaching 95% full on the on the evening of the ninth, you can watch that all night. Evening of the ninth into the morning of the tenth. There you go. So you can track the moon across there against different objects and look at some of the planets. Now in the evening, in the beginning of the week, before the moon gets to be too bright, one of the things you can see is you can check out uh, 
Orion here. There's the belt of Orion and Betelgeuse and Bright Star rides on the legs and the shoulders of Orion. And we looked at last week, Sirius is down here below. So Sirius is the brightest star in the sky below Orion. And Procyon is a nice bright star that's up there, sort of level with Sirius sits below the legs of Orion, below Rigel, a brightest object in the region, so you can't miss it. And Procyon is the bright object that sits about level with the shoulder stars up here next to, to Betelgeuse. Also a bright star, pretty hard to miss. Sirius is a negative 1.4 magnitude star. Uh, and so again, these things count backwards. Uh, Procyon is a 0 0.4 magnitude star, both uh, among the brightest star, very, the very brightest star in the sky. And Procyon is often listed, I think, as the eighth brightest star in the sky. So big, bright, beautiful stars. On the line between them, is an open star cluster M50. So it's closer to Sirius than it is to Procyon, but scan up with your binoculars or your small telescope and about uh, a third of the way or so up toward uh, Procyon, you're gonna stumble across this nice open star cluster. So go check out that open star cluster. Both Sirius and Procyon are what we call main sequence stars. And, and, and astronomers are fond of making something called an HR diagram, where we plot temperature that increases this way and luminosity, how much energy the star is emitting, how bright the star is, increasing up this way. And we have this main sequence that looks something like this. And hotter, higher mass stars are over this way, and cooler stars are over this way. The hotter and higher mass the star is, the more luminous it is, the more energy it's emitting per time. And so, you know, if the sun's somewhere like that, uh, Procyon is up here, and Sirius is up here. So these are uh, a big bright Sirius star. Sirius is a big bright star. It's not among the very brightest stars. And we have giant stars and dwarf stars that are here. And so it's not among those very brightest, luminous, most luminous stars, but it's pretty close. It's 8.6 light years distant. So it's only about twice as far away from us as the nearest star. Uh, so it's pretty close. It's not the closest star. It's not the brightest star, but it's a good combination of both of those things. It's about 25 times brighter than the sun, about two times the mass of the sun. So one of the things we learned is on the main sequence, uh, how bright a star is, how luminous it is, how much energy it's emitting, goes up rapidly with mass. And so at two times the mass of the sun, uh, we get 20, 25 times the, these are rough approximations, the, the luminosity of the sun. Now, interestingly, uh, let's look at Procyon first. It's, got, it's about seven times the luminosity of the sun, and it's about 11 light years, about almost one and a half times farther away, not quite. And it's uh, about three times less luminous. And so those things combine to make it significantly uh, 0.4, 0.4, whatever that is, uh, you know, six, eight, ten times less bright on the sky uh, than Sirius is right here. Uh, and it's about one and a half times the mass of the sun. So it's halfway between the sun and Sirius in mass. Both of these stars, interestingly, have white dwarf companions. These white dwarfs that exist down here, these are the cores of low mass stars that have, have blown off, have sloughed off their outer layers, their, their shells. And what they have left is just the inert core that's down in there, often a carbon-nitrogen-oxygen core that's very hot because that star was hot on the interior and it's just cooling off, no longer fusing material. Uh, these main sequence stars are fusing hydrogen into helium in the core, and that's how they're getting the energy to support the, the light that they're emitting out into space. White dwarf stars aren't doing that. They're just cooling down. Each of these has a companion. Now, Sirius's companion... Uh, you can see it. It's very hard to see because these are faint, faint stars. They're little tiny cores, so they're not very bright, even though they're hot down in here. And so there's these, these faint stars that are really close to really bright stars, which makes them very difficult to see. But right now is your best chance, and I've read people talk about this. I haven't tried it, uh, to go out and see the white dwarf companion of Sirius because it varies from about three arc seconds. Uh, an arc minute is a 60th of a degree. Uh, uh, an arc second is a 60th of an arc minute. So from about three arc seconds to 11 arc seconds, and we are close to this widest separation end right now. So a good telescope and really good seeing, really good steady skies in a cold winter sky like this, and you might be able to see the white dwarf companion of, um, it got me excited thinking about it. Maybe I'll go out and try it in, in, the, in the coming coming days here. Uh, you might be able to see the white dwarf companion of Sirius. Procyon's white dwarf companion is, a, the orbital period's 50, 50 years there and about 40 years for Procyon's, and it only varies from 2.2 to 5 arc seconds, so it never gets any, it, and it's closer to this end right now. I don't think you're going to see the white dwarf companion to Procyon. So tr if you want to try Sirius, give it a try. I think it'd be great. Let me know if you see it. <laughs> 
I, 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 would, I would love to know it. Now, Procyon is part of, this is Canis Major, is serious. Procyon's part of Canis mi Minor, and we really usually only identify three main stars beyond that. About four and a third degrees uh, the, is, is the beta star away off to the, off to the east, west, uh, uh, Gamesa. And Gamesa is a third magnitude star, pretty easy to see. There's a fainter fourth magnitude star that sits about two-thirds of a degree, less than a degree above Gamesa, is the Gamma star. The Gamma star, so go out and see if you can find those stars and enjoy learning Canis Minor a little bit better. Uh, those stars, the, the, the Gamma star is actually part of a spectroscopic binary. And we've talked about spectroscopic binaries on and off for the last couple of months, where we see the dark lines in the spectrum of the stars, and we see two stars, and we see one of them blue shifted as it's coming toward us in orbit. The other one's moving away from us in orbit. So we see these lines uh, getting shorter. One of them has shorter wavelength than we'd expect. One of them has longer wavelength than, than that we expect than the average. And then they both have the same wavelength. Then they switch places like this. This is two giant stars. So we looked at a, a, a star in Sirius that was two times the mass of the sun, one and a half times the mass of the sun in Procyon. But here we have one that's about 1.9 times the mass of the sun, two of them. Um, but they're 300 times the luminosity of the sun. None of this 20 times or 10 times or 5 times the luminosity of the sun. 300 times. There's these giant stars that are up here. Stars that have fused all of the hydrogen into helium in the core, and now they're going to be fusing hydrogen into helium in a shell around that inert helium core, and they get bright. They get cool and bright as they ascend up this way. These are orange stars and, and, and these red giant stars. Uh, it, that, that make up uh, two of them in a spectroscopic binary that make up the gamma star in uh, Canis Minor. So that's what we got. Canis Major, Canis Minor. Think about white dwarf stars. Think about stellar evolution a little bit. Uh, think about what we have going on. Enjoy the moon moving against the background stars and the planets. And as always, thanks for watching, everybody. And we hope you have a great week of observing ahead.